which is in about three minutes at that time if unless you are in line and I do not believe there's a line out there uh, and if you are not registered then the time will be up and that's it Senator West Madam Chair thank you very much and this is a chair to the author of the bill I apologize for not being in it when you were laying it out we have education going on how will this bill assuming that it becomes the law of the state of Texas which I'm against but if it becomes the law of the state of Texas how will this bill be implemented and who will enforce it uh, and the how will it be enforced the, the attorney general uh, senator uh, on page two um, of a less than uh, page two uh, it's only a two-page bill. Right. The section may be enforced only through an action instituted by the Attorney General for mandamus or injunctive relief. The Attorney General may recover costs and attorney's fees relating to the portion of it. I understand that portion, but on a practical basis, let's say the bill is law. How is a specific infraction okay. of this law, how is it reported, and how does one in a school district yep. kind of police it? Right. So um, we heard from testimony already today. Some school districts have policies already uh, in place. Th this bill, Senate Bill 3, the approach, similar to uh, House Bill 2899, says that this is a state purview, the, the, this <coughs> under political subdivisions. Mm -hmm. And so that the uh, political subdivisions uh, cannot institute a, a policy that differs from this unless unless overturned so so the the um enforcements by the ag if a school district um or uil or anyone else uh, uh actually crafts a policy different than that then it would be up to the local uh political divisions uh subdivisions to um if if there was a complaint Okay, by a student. Stay, stay, stay right there. Stay right there. Uh -huh. If I'm transgender mm -hmm. and I go to a restroom, another student can make a complaint. Is that how that works? No. If if a policy is adopted uh, that otherwise would be uh, opposite. Of, well, I'm not of talking this. about the policy now. It, it becomes the law of the land. I'm not talking about the adoption of a policy. I'm talking mm -hmm. about enforcement of the law that is being considered here. Mm -hmm basically saying that you have to, whatever sex is on your birth certificate, if I violate that and go to a bathroom other than what's on my birth certificate and there's a complaint, who makes the complaint? Well, I, I think it takes on a number of, 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 of ways to go. I think initially if it was in a school, the student would complain to the school board. Uh, and, and we've seen that in Dripping Springs ISD. Um, so we'll take that example. Dripping Springs ISD, unbeknownst to most of the parents there, um, there was a policy that was adopted uh, in, I think it was executive board of the Dripping Springs ISD, and this is off of mem memory from Senate Bill 6 okay. testimony. Mm -hmm. And then the parents uh, actually brought complaint to the school district. The school district didn't, did not act, but he herein lies, if you'll let me finish this, okay. Okay. Um, that then if Senate Bill 3 passed, the parents would have the ability now to go to the attorney general to say the school district, you know, and this was one specific case. When you're talking about one specific child, uh, as I understand it, in one of their elementary schools, it was a specific case then in this, the, the relief would be by those parents instead of going to the school board in Dripping Springs ISD, which I'm told uh, was, it was even hard to get, like, to be able to, to talk to the school board. They would have the ability uh, to appeal to the attorney general who, uh, whose office then uh, would receive the complaint and investigate the policies that had been adopted. Um, let's go back to the complaint. That's mm -hmm. where I am. All right, a student complains to their parents. What type of evidence would be necessary in order to sustain or overturn that particular complaint? When you're talking about like, would there be a court case or well, the well, evidence? Well, no, yeah, well, something like that, but I, obviously I, I assume it's administrative, et cetera. But if you were to complain to sit up and say that they saw Senator Zaffarini go into the wrong restaurant, Okay, it, it's your evidence. You, it's you making the complaint. I've been seeing what? 
what would what type of evidence would you as the complainant need to be able to uh, show or utilize to make certain that that complaint is sustained you, you understand I think what that saying? would be well I, I don't think we're talking about the one instance I think that we're talking about uh, I'll go to the case in Pennsylvania where uh, a young man man has now brought suit um, because there was a female in the dressing room who has now identified as uh, a male, so female to male, and uh, he has brought suit because he went to the school district to say, I'm not comfortable. Uh, and uh, they have denied that. Um, they have t told him, as I have read, uh, that there's nothing going to be done. And so I think there's a lot of different remedies, but we're not talking about that one instance. I think that we're talking about more of the, a, a policy, uh, a policy, the policy. And that is what this particular bill um, really talks about is si similar to uh, Senator Rodriguez, who, who filed a bill this session. I think there's several joint authors who really, it, it's, a, it's saying it's a state purview and this is what we want it to be. It's the opposite of Senate Bill 3 in, in creating a protective class that um, Title IX doesn't actually address or, or, or some discrepancies that he might see in Title VII, which he and I had a long exchange about today. And, you know, he's, he's filed a bill actually opposite of Senate Bill 3. And when I say that, not exactly opposite, but a different uh, tack to say it's a state purview and here's what the state Here's what we want to see the state do. And, and again, I'm talking about uh, at state's purview. Okay, bill passed state purview, and the state puts in place this particular bill. If someone violates this particular policy, obviously an individual citizen, I assume, would be able to make a complaint if they saw someone violating the policy. Correct. Mm -hmm. All right. Again, and that's where I am uh, at the granular level, uh, as it would uh, practically apply to a person who would be suspected of violating this particular policy. What type of evidence would I as the complainant saying that you violated the policy need to be able to provide to whatever authority, the Attorney General, whomever, uh, to say that there was a violation and is there any penalty for that violation? Yeah, I think the OAG would have to investigate. And, and, and when you say that, you know, that's true of what, you know, you're a lawyer. Um, in any case, what is the evidence? I mean, it comes down to the evidence. Of, of any case, and so the OAG would investigate, and then eventually the court issues a mandamus to correct. Uh, and so uh, I, I, I would say that um, we know, um, for example, in this bill, Senate Bill 3, uh, I think it would be pretty evident if uh, a male was running track or playing basketball. Basketball, you are a basketball player, and so someone of your size decides that they uh, want to play um Girls basketball. At that's pretty Dow evident. At, at that's evident right there. What about a restaurant, though? Um, <laughs> I think this applies to to everything uh, in that way. And, and how this bill, less specific than Senate Bill 6, very much less than Senate Bill 6. Senate Bill 6 was a multi-page um, bill that went into more detail. And, and Senator West, I know you weren't here when I laid it out, is that when Governor Abbott, Greg Abbott, uh, did his uh, press conference in calling for the special session and named the 19, ultimately 20 issues. He specifically referenced House Bill uh, 2899, which had a hearing in uh, the House about uh, that particular um, approach to governance, making it a state purview rather than uh, letting each one of the school districts, which we could have different school districts make different decisions. We just heard Leander ISD uh, has a policy against allowing a transgender individual, a uh, transgender person from going into the restrooms. We had um, uh, a young man uh, come uh, and a transgender male come and testify. And so each school district now, it's a patchwork of uh, uh, different policies and what Senate Bill three attempts to do is to say that's a state purview and then if any change is made by Congress or by the legislature, Senator Rodriguez, a bill similar to his, or the Supreme Court of the United States, uh, then it, it yields to that policy. Uh, but this is the policy and, and this is how we're... So a transgender student that would violate the policy would be subject to suspension? 
Uh, no, the, the, it's very silent. It's not an individual action against that person. It is an, um, an action, the OIG can take action against the political subdivision of the violation. Now, we could get into trespassing and different things that I think will be left up to some interpretation. But uh, if you take the cases that we've seen in Target, uh, we've seen uh, in, in, in other situations, I do think that they're, those are private businesses and we don't touch that with this particular bill. No, I'm talking about the schools now, public. Yep. Okay. So, okay, so we'll go I, back I, to I, schools. Maybe, maybe right. I'm misunderstanding. I think the school will have to enforce it because we have set. And so, this. how would the school enforce it? That's that's where I am on the granular yeah, level. Yeah. How, how does be, the would they, school? Would the student? How does state, this, pu state uh, Excuse me, one second. State sure. has a policy, mm -hmm. and then you're saying the school would have to implement that policy. And the question is, is how do they implement the policy if someone runs afoul of the policy? Right. Here, here to before, what they would do is suspension, expulsion, et cetera. Would the students that violated this particular policy be subject to the same sort of sanctions? I think what, what, what they're doing currently is we see a patchwork of, of different policies across our state. Uh, no, is I'm, I'm asking, what do you anticipate, assuming that you have one policy across the state, what do you anticipate the sanctions being for a student that violated the statewide policy in our public school system? What do you anticipate the sanctions would be? Suspension, expulsion, suspension, what? I, I don't think so. I think that's left up to each school district. And I, I think that, that, that the bill speaks to that um, it's, it's what is on the birth certificate. And, and you would say, well, today, how do they enforce these rules? Because and, and many school districts will say privately, you know, we've been handling some of these situations. We give um, um, we give personal accommodations uh, to to children uh, with uh, special needs, and and I think that that will con will continue today. So, so that would be one of the methods. If there's a violation, that would be one of the methods. Yeah, the and, and today me, the me, only let me recourse. Let me finish, let me finish. But I so want to say me. something about the recourse today. Is parents go to the school boards. Um, and what we have seen is, is um, you know, again, you can you can read what you at all of this in, in some newspaper articles, and, and you can go back to the testimony on Senate Bill Six. But uh, the recourse is with the school district. Now we are allowing parents to have recourse with the attorney general if they believe the school district is in violation of this policy. I'm assume, assuming that a student is in violation of the policy. That's where I am, the granular level. And I'm trying to figure out what sanctions would the students be subjected to for being in violation of the policy. Bill is silent to that. Do you think that there should be some clarification in terms of what the sanctions should be? I don't think so. Why, why is that? I don't know. I hadn't heard any testimony to say differently, and I've listened to 18 plus. Uh, we've been at it three hours today, 22 hours of testimony and hundreds of meetings, uh, and, and haven't said we have not taken personal action against a student. It is more aimed at the policy and to allow the school districts uh, to handle the situations as they see fit. But you would agree with me that if we come up with a statewide policy, then school districts would be responsible for implementing that policy. And if they don't, then they're subject to mandamus, as you've mentioned. And in implementing the policy, the implementation of the policy would go to the individual students. If a student violated that policy, like any other policy of a school district, there are certain sanctions that are applicable to that particular student. And those sanctions, based on what I understand in the education code, would be expulsion and, and or suspension. And I'm just trying to understand the legislative intent. What is your intent in terms of what the sanctions would be? The sanction is against the school district uh, at this point, not the individual. So then the bill is silent in terms of any sanctions the school district would end up uh, meting out against the individual student that violated the policy. That's it is silent on that. And you have no legislative intent in terms of what the sanction should be? I have not created any. Okay. Is that it? All right. All right. We will get started with Ron Nuremberg. Right. Yeah, let me, just before we get started, let me call the next five to sit um, in the first row. Raymond Malou, Malo, M-D, M-A-I-L-L-O-U-S. Rose, excuse me, Rose, I'm thinking why. Rose McBurnett, uh, Car Carl McBurnett, 
Mike Floyd, and Christian Palmer. And now, Vaughn, recognize. Chair Huffman and members of the State Affairs Committee, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. The City of San Antonio stands with other communities in opposition to Senate Bill 3 and Senate Bill 91 by Senator Kolkhorst. San Antonio is a welcoming and inclusive place where people from many backgrounds and beliefs come together to make it a great place to live and to visit. These bills are in direct conflict with these values we hold as a community. The legislation puts transgender people in the crosshairs of, dis of discrimination in an attempt to protect children and women from a problem that clearly does not exist. This legislation threatens the state's economy and lives of citizens we all represent because discrimination is as bad for business as it is for the safety of the most vulnerable members of our community. SB 3 and SB 91 would create the highly negative and harmful perception that San Antonio and Texas are not open and hospitable places. Like all Texas cities, San Antonio competes for business, relocations, conventions, and major sporting events. This bill Im impedes our ability to compete. We also focus on economic development efforts tar on targeted industries such as advanced manufacturing, information technology, cybersecurity, and healthcare, and this bill will stunt the growth of the San Antonio and Texas new economies. San Antonio educators also united against this legislation. Bear County superintendents representing 15 school districts have signed a letter voicing opposition to this legislation, and you have at your dais letters from our business community as well as you've, you've heard the testimony from our Chambers of Commerce, President and CEO, as well as the President and CEO of Visit San Antonio. But in the end, proponents of the bill have stated that this is geared toward public safety. You have at your dais a letter from Police Chief William McManus stating that sexual assault in public restrooms is not a problem in San Antonio. Multiple state laws already criminalize the conduct that this bill purports to address. In other, in other words, SB 3 and SB 91 are fixes in search of a problem. We implore you to stand against this legislation. Thank you, Mayor, and I apologize for not addressing you as Mayor when you sat down. Quite I, all right. I don't think we've ever met, and I wasn't glad, didn't have my glasses, not glancing the car. Thank so you, welcome. Sir. Thank you. Madam Chair. Yes, Senator Zaffer. Welcome, Mayor. Thank you. How long have you been Mayor of the City of San Antonio now? About a month. About a month. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I don't know you. <laughs> so this is your first Senate hearing? Uh, it is not. I've served on the City Council since 2013. No, but you've been to the Senate hearings before to testify? Not on this particular legislation, no, in previous ones. Right. You heard the testimony, of course, of other representatives of the city of San Antonio. Do you have any information to add regarding the, the economic impact on the city of San Antonio should this legislation pass? Only just to underscore uh, not just the economic impact, which we've already felt just by the proposal of this legislation, which we know is in roughly about $3 million direct economic impact, but the daily emails and phone calls and concerns uh, from members of our community, many, many who, of whom you've heard from already and will continue to hear from throughout the day about this, uh, this legislation that, again, uh, uses the fear of issues that do not arise unless these bad laws are put on the books. And your written testimony says that this would impair our ability to compete across the nation. Could you give us specific examples of how passing this legislation would impede that competitive ability? Besides the already direct impact from convention business and visitor business that have already pulled out of San Antonio and Texas, uh, we know that we have uh, many concerns, calls uh, to our visit San Antonio offices and to the city of San Antonio about what happens if uh, this legislation is passed. Uh, we know that we are competing uh, for not just the NCAA Final Four that's coming here in 2018, which is already here, and we know what the NCAA has done in its past, uh, but we're also working to compete for future convention business and Final Four business and major sporting events. Um, again, we don't expect uh, to see direct economic impact the day that this is passed, but the, the way that convention and visitor business works is that we're already competing for business four or five years from now, and they're already telling us they will not come uh, if Texas passes the, these laws. How would these bills or passage of these bills impact the sports community, specifically the San Antonio Spurs and other sports organizations in San Antonio or throughout the state? 
Well, San Antonio prides itself on being an inclusive place, uh, being a place where we work to be free from discrimination. And our major businesses, um, many of whom have signed on to a letter that you have at your desks, uh, are against. Our tech community has uh, been testifying and, and appearing here at the Capitol. Uh, our major employers are all united against uh, this legislation, and, and that's why I'm here. I represent them. I represent the members of our community that this legislation targets, uh, and I will continue to do so uh, to uh, try and avoid uh, this from becoming law. Do you know of any issue or problem in the city of San Antonio that would be resolved or corrected by passing this legislation? None whatsoever. And if there is a public safety argument to be made, it has been done by the city of San Antonio Police Chief William McManus, uh, who states pretty def definitively that there is no problem that this would solve. Okay. Thank you, Mary. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Menendez. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to thank our new mayor, Mayor Ron Nuremberg, for being here with us. It was good to see you and your family and the whole city, most of the city council at the Pride Parade recently. I want to say that uh, this letter that you brought us from the chief seems to answer the question because you ran on the issue of public safety. And therefore, I know that you would do nothing that would cause uh, any, any, any member of our community to be unsafe. Um, I've spoken to some of the largest employers that we have in, in San Antonio, and I've asked them, one of whom's got about 400 locations around the state, one of the largest employers we have. And I said, do you have a problem with people entering the wrong bathroom for any situation? They said, we never have a problem with this happening. And so, Mayor, uh, you're t you've taken your time to be here and sit and listen. Um, I think at the end of the day, you would never propose doing something, just even if it were costing us hundreds of millions of dollars, which we know it will, if it would cause anyone to be less safe, correct? That's right. I mean, I think that um, everyone in the state speaks uh, economics, um, and we all hopefully uh, speak on human rights terms as well. But um, the common denominator should be uh, the fact that this is discriminatory legislation, um, and discrimination is not good for the economy. And, and the sad thing about that is that it's it's packaged, and I don't think it's intended to be, but that is the net impact. That's the net effect. It's packaged in, in this uh, creating a safer situation, but in, in the net effect is, is causing some folks to be less safe. And that's that's why I think so many of us are going are, are against this legislation. And I want to thank you for being here. I, I, last question. Are you aware of the letter that was signed? And I think it was signed late yesterday. It was written by some of the largest employers in San Antonio, many conservative business leaders, uh, Zachary, Newstar, Valero, many, many of them. I, I don't have all of them, but I understand it was more than a dozen uh, that sent in opposition to this. Uh, yes, and in, in fact, we are all very proud of them for that. Um, they, uh, they sent me a copy of the letter. Uh, that's also why you heard from the president and CEO of uh, the San Antonio Chamber of Commerce. Uh, the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce is here as well. Uh, the Texas Association of Business uh, is here. Uh, they represent San Antonio and we represent them. And every one of our school districts in Bear County is opposed as well, correct? That's correct. Fifteen school districts signed on to a letter that you should have at your desk as well. Mayor, thank you for everything you're doing to make our city a, a better place to raise a family and to live. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, we have Lisa Chair, Schultz. Chair Huffman. Yes, I, I have a quick, recognize. quick question. And I mean, maybe Senator Menendez, being from San Antonio, you may know this better. Um, do you know of how your 15 school districts voted on um, in the UIL each, um, I think it is each uh, principal of now, each superintendent gets to vote on um, uh, policies. Uh, there was a policy February 20, uh, February 2016 about uh, the inclusiveness or non-inclusiveness of uh, males uh, participating in female sports. Do you know how they voted? I don't have a clue, but what I will do is my staff's in the office listening to this both in San Antonio and here, and we'll get the answer yeah. for you to, uh, I, later today. I, I would like to know how they feel about uh, males being able to compete in uh, women's sports, girls' sports. We will get that UIL. answer to you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. All right, thank you. Lisa Sheps. Great. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair and committee. Thank you for hearing us. My name is Lisa Sheps. I'm the interim executive director of an organization that advocates on behalf of the gender diverse by the gender diverse. 
Uh, and I just want to start out by saying, uh, Senator Kolkhorst, uh, you know, you talked about.